Hello everyone, uh, thanks for having me here in this wonderful virtual event discussing the state of the source in 2020. My name is Thierry Carrez, I'm based in France and I work for the OpenStack Foundation, which is an OSI affiliate organization. So if I had to summarize in one word the state of open source in 2020, I would say that open source is now ubiquitous. A synopsis study shows that it's been adopted by 99% of companies in 2020, compared to only 39% 10 years ago. That's huge. Another study, this one by Tidelift, says that 70% of products, software products, are composed of more open source code than proprietary code in 2019. Open source has really become a standard in how to produce software. So open source is ubiquitous, and yet it's hard to say that open source has won. While open source is a critical part of most products and services in 2020, most products and services are still proprietary. We also see a lot of code released as open source, but where contribution is limited to a single company, which prevents you from scratching your own itch. We see a lot of open source being provided as a service, but where the code used to provide it as a service is proprietary, which prevents you from understanding it or duplicating it. We see open source as the default way of producing software, but in a lot of cases, it just becomes yet another abandoned personal fork on GitHub with no hope of ever forming a vibrant community. And finally, we still see a key gap between producers of the software and consumers of the software, resulting in a lot of users, but not so many contributors. That creates tension for maintaining projects. And what about those attacks against the OSI? The open source definition is outdated, they say. It prevents successful businesses to be formed on open source, they say. Something has really gone wrong. Along the way, in the last 10 years, we lost something. It's really time to go back to the basics. Like, what is open source? Open source is not a business model. At the root, open source is just a definition maintained by the Open Source Initiative. It defines essential freedoms and rights that software licenses must allow in order for the licensed software to be called open source. Those essential freedoms and rights derive from the free software for freedoms with extra emphasis added on user rights to encourage ubiquitous usage. And historically, those freedoms and rights associated with free and open source software have led to a number of benefits. There is availability, the fact that there is no barrier, monetary or contractual or otherwise, to trying out the software with all of its functionality. The fact that you can simply evaluate the software for future use, experiment with it, or just have fun with it. The fact that there is no friction in transitioning from that experimentation to production. There is sustainability. Source code being available for anyone to modify means that you're not relying on a single vendor for long-term maintenance and you're not locked in. There is a fluid job market where it's easier to identify and attract talent. Enterprises can easily identify potential recruits based on the open record of their contributions to the technology that they are interested in. And conversely, candidates can easily identify with the open source technologies an organization is using. They can join a company with certainty that they will be able to capitalize on the software experience that they will grow there. There is transparency, where access to the source code means being technically able to look under the hood 
and understand by yourself how the software works or why it behaves the way it does. And one step beyond that, there is surf service with the ability to take and modify the source code, meaning you have the possibility to find and fix issues by yourself without even depending on a vendor. And finally, there is influenceability. With open source, you have the possibility to engage in the community developing the software and to influence its direction by contributing directly to it. Organizations that engage in the open development communities are more efficient. They can anticipate changes. They can voice concerns about decisions that would adversely affect them. They can make sure the software adapts to their future needs by growing the features that they will need tomorrow. And those are not abstract or philosophical benefits. Those are all practical, undisputable business benefits. And they led to the massive adoption of open source in our industry and to the popularity of open source as a brand. But deep below, at the core, open source is still just a set of licenses. And given time and resources, businesses have found multiple ways of abiding to the letter of those licenses, but not the spirit of those licenses. It is possible to respect the terms of the license while denying freedoms and rights that the license were meant to encapsulate. Cooptation means appropriation of something for a new or different purpose. And that, that really is what those businesses did. They effectively co-opted open source. They did so by inventing new ways of producing open source or new ways of providing open source. Like they found ways to do open source while retaining control. And by retaining control, they deprived users of key benefits like sustainability or influenceability. They invented open core, a way to use open source as trialware, pretending to be open source to sell what is ultimately a proprietary product, depriving users of benefits like availability. And the emergence of cloud computing enabled software as a service models. Those are purely around running the software and they insert a layer between the hand users and the open source developers. And by doing that, they deprived users of benefits like transparency or self-service. So that is how the spirit of open source, the traditional benefits associated with open source were eroded. It started as various experiments, but soon they claimed to be the new normal, default way of doing open source. We were used to resisting to proprietary software, but this time the attack was coming from the inside, from so-called commercial open source software companies, painting open core as the default way of producing open source. And more recently, they felt sufficiently confident to attempt to redefine open source to actually remove freedoms. They tried to make non-compete licenses be recognized as open source licenses. Non-compete licenses are licenses where it's forbidden to commercially compete with you. It obviously discriminates on fields of endeavor, which is a key part of the open source definition, but it also shows that those companies consider open source not as a commons to cultivate, but as an asset to control and monetize. And when the OSI resisted that attack, they started to undermine the OSI authority and legitimacy. Open source is not for them to define, they said. So that's the stat state of the source, sad state of the source in 2020. It's high time we regroup and fight back. But before we discuss tactics, I think we should first agree on the end goal. What do we really want open source to enable? I thought about this and converged to four 
desirable outcomes that open source, in my opinion, should ultimately provide. The first one is making technology accessible to everyone. At the root, open source is all about facilitating distribution and availability of software. Using open source, we can make sure technology is equally accessible to all humans on the planet. We can make sure every company in the world is given the means to technically compete with the giants. We can avoid monopolies and monocultures for greater resilience. The second goal is enabling permissionless innovation. Open source removes barriers to remixing and improving technology, maximizing innovation. This innovation can happen without asking for permission from the incumbents. The third goal is reducing duplication of effort. Too much energy on this planet is wasted reinventing the wheel in every tribe. This is no longer sustainable. Open source allows everyone to openly collaborate to build common solutions, avoiding duplication of the same effort everywhere. And the final goal is cultivating consumers' producers. Free software is born in the hackers' community from the need to fix a printer, as the story goes. It promised a world where people would see the source and be able to modify and improve it. It promised a generation of consumers of code who would also be producers of code, knowing how the devices they use actually work, not just mindless consumers. We're far away from that today but I still think open source is the solution to fix it. And as Andrew Huang most eloquently put it, and I'll read the quote, the point of open source is not to ritualistically compile our stuff from source. It's the awareness that technology is not magic, that there is a trail of breadcrumbs any of us could follow to liberate our dig digital lives in case of a potential hostage situation. Should we so desire, Open source empowers us to create and run our own essential tools and services. So that's the angle. But how do we get there? What tactics should we employ? I would argue that first we need to accept to go beyond licenses. Licenses are an essential tool in our tool belt to enforce user freedoms and rights. But in, in my opinion, they are not the only tool we should use. If we want to restore the spirit of open source and reach the objectives that we just defined, we need to use other tools. In particular, licenses apply to the resulting software. They say nothing about how the software should be built. And how the software is built actually matters. Co-optation of open source with control was made possible because we say nothing about the how. And we all know how to openly collaborate to produce open source that preserves all the benefits I mentioned earlier. Open collaboration on a level playing field, welcoming everyone with vendor neutral governance guarantees everyone can join and participate that the software is free from vendor locking, that everyone has the ability to influence the direction of the software. So I advocate for the need to clearly distinguish healthy and sustainable collaboration patterns like open collaboration from toxic patterns like single vendor open source or open core development. We should agree on a clear taxonomy of those patterns and speak with a common voice. What about open source foundations? Um, well, they usually provide a trademark asset log, which helps at making development more neutral. But beyond that, they're all different. 
it's not as simple as uh, all C3 charities are good and all C6 trade associations are bad. You have to look at the details. For example, with trade associations, you'll see that in a lot of cases, the open source projects are not governed by the foundation they're housed under. They have their own independent governance body, distinct from the trade association paying members. You will see that some foundations care about the how and codified it so that only truly open collaborations are accepted, like Apache Software Foundation has the Apache way or the OpenStack Foundation has the four opens. And once we are ready to speak with a common voice, we'll need to go educate again. We were good at promoting open versus closed, free software against proprietary. But as open source became ubiquitous, we stopped educating people and we opened our side to internal attacks. So we need to speak again about the spirit of open source, speak again about our end goals and denounce cooptation that drives us away from those end goals. And I would like to encourage the OSI membership to take on that fight. Thank you for your attention. So please add your questions to the shared notes. I see one from Miguel there. Um, I had the impression that software as a service models work very well with the AGPL license. Don't you think that it's sometimes an attempt to not create an ecosystem around the project and still claim it's open source? Yes, obviously, I mean, there's a very good uh, blog article from uh, from Bradley at the Software Conservancy on on uh, the the state of copyleft licenses and and uh, how they've been in some cases at GPL in particular uh, used in in nefarious ways and not their uh, their initial initial goals and. Uh, Yes, the problem is a GPL, if you start adding, especially uh, contributor license agreements to it, is, is a way to, uh, to build a non-compete license. And uh, if, you, if you are the only one being able to contribute to a project and at the same time uh, you, you, um, you uh, force everyone to uh, just um, contribute their, their changes if they're running the software, it, creates a dynamic there that that is clearly not uh, balanced and uh, and really uh, really functional follow-up question um, so CLA are a signal of bad well CLAs it's it there is CLAs and CLAs <laughs> so uh, like a uh, Usually you have CLAs attached to the Apache license that are not necessarily about copyright assignment or uh, giving up control over your contribution. Um, so you have to look into the details, but um, they've been traditionally used um, together, copyright assignment CLAs and, and, um, and AGPL have been used in the past to, to provide very strong control over, uh, over a project. Question from Peter, any thoughts? for someone trying to set up a non-profit project for software for public benefit. Listening to speakers today, I have a combination of idealism and despair. <laughs> yes, um, I, I don't really have any, any suggestion there. Um, it really depends on the case and uh, uh, but there are lots of people that can help you try to find with more details on on what you're what you're after uh try to find the right structure there are lots of options um and uh, depends entirely on the dynamics of the project i will not say that like everything needs to go to the OpenStack foundation or i think gail would not say everything needs to go to the eclipse foundation it's really a, a question of what you're after what type of software you're running what type of community you want to join and uh, and and exactly what you expect from from the structures that can help you host it. Uh, what are your thoughts on finding a common denominator on what open source projects can do to onboard contributors better? I think we need to share more. Like um, bet between communities, uh, there is a lot of experience, but there is there is a temptation to paint 
adverse communities uh, as the enemy. Like it's it's a very adversarial world where uh, where like if you're you're part of that community, you're the enemy of my community. And what you realize once you start sharing is that you can learn a lot from from anyone's experience. And I remember uh, going to uh, to a KubeCon a few years ago once we could still travel. Uh, and and uh, reaching out to the Kubernetes community and try to bring the experience from the OpenStack world uh, and try to to talk about what we did, what we did wrong, what did we did right, what what mistakes there there they might be making in our footsteps, um, and and that discussion was really really interesting. And what we are seeing is that. Um, on, especially on contributor onboarding, there is a lot of diversity in the way uh, people um, start onboarding new members. And there are plenty of, of solutions that can be shared and and uh, and thought in common. So my my recommendation would be to to share more uh, your experience doing it with others uh, having the same the same kind of problems. And uh, and uh, see how you can you can do this onboarding better, um, but obviously onboarding new contributors is uh, is an ongoing challenge for all projects. It used not to be much of a problem for uh, for OpenStack because there were so many uh, companies throwing resources uh, and contributors at it. But today, with less vendors and more users, more direct users, we're we're uh, in the same stage as as most most open source projects, we're lo looking for more contributors. We're trying to onboard new contributors. We're reaching out to universities to try to uh, to uh, train them to uh, using the software and contributing to it um, really early on. And and so I think and like Kubernetes, which is like the the real hotness right now, is also in some cases struggling to find contributors to do the strategic contributions like uh, QA and release management. And, and so it's, it's, it's a very common problem and it should be discussed in common. With the growth of the open source ecosystem, are we stretching available resources too thin? I don't think so. Like open source is, is extremely successful. And if we could just uh, like have this culture that you should it's it's appropriate to give back if you if you are using the software um, if we could build that culture back into um, open source consumers if it if it was frowned upon not to uh, not to contribute in any meaningful ways back to the project um, I, I think we would be in a good good state like if only one percent of of openstack users were we're contributing half uh, a few hours a day, a few hours a week uh, to to help with the project. Even if only one percent of the users did that, we would be we would be in a very good shape. So it feels like it's 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 more that we need to to um, to fix the culture that it's completely okay to uh, consume the project without helping producing it. And and today it's it's like. Yeah, you can do it. So why not do it? And and it's almost like like um, someone there was there was a presentation earlier on the comments and and there was this quote from Adrian Cockcroft at Amazon and it's like oh it makes business sense to just take you know and, and if you if you if you give back you're just like uh, you're not doing it right <laughs> and so if you can say that at a conference without that being uh, extremely frowned upon and and it, it means we need to change the culture around around consuming open source, and uh, it should not be normal to consume without without contributing something uh, back to to the project one way or another. Question from Josh: If you could ask the OSI to just do one thing, <laughs> uh, I've been asked that question before by the OSI. Still, have to think about it. My brain is not working right now. Uh, if I just have one wish, um, I think uh, what you presented, Josh, in your keynote uh, on layers is, I think, really interesting. I think we need to grow. Um, I need we need like I, like I said it in in one of my slides. Like we need to go beyond licenses and 
and uh, and add layers on. Yes, there is. You can you can just like publish your software with an open source license. That's good. Making making it openly developed. That's better. And and making it openly governed. That's even better. And be extremely clear that those are layers as important as the 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 open source definition that we use for the licenses. I think that that will really help in in uh, spreading the word on the right way of doing it because it's way too easy for for uh, um, groups of people companies to to hide their bad open source in the middle of of our good open source and and everyone is using the same word like it's open source so it's good and it's hard enough to fight all the people that like are assumed to be open source but are not really like because their messaging is confusing like uh, github or or um, travis ci or others that are that that are so embedded in the open source world that people assume that they're open source um and but there are also so many so many groups that are claiming to do open source while the only thing they have in common with really uh, open collaborations is the license that they are using and now we have sometimes more in common with with proprietary software than with some of the open source software depending on how that software is actually uh, developed so their proprietary software that is more open developed than some open source software and that worries me how could you teach the spirit of open source should we take an approach more from a moral sociology perspective yes i think that that would definitely help i see that uh, uh, using other other uh, other domains to find the right way of explaining those things is really useful uh, but i think we need to we need to uh, start talking with the same words because we're, we're like like someone said in the notes uh, we're preaching to this to the chore here where like everyone is basically agreeing with me uh, what we need to do is start using the same words to speak about it so that we demultiply our uh, the, our when we talk about it that it reaches more than just uh, us you know and and hopefully uh, if we start designating all the bad usage using the same terminology that will finally um, beat their usage their lazy usage of open source and 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 uh, communicate more healthy collaboration patterns for uh, for open source sorry i will not have time to address the last question but i'll try to type in the notes